Great, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Reg Gakey. I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's Washington, D.C. office and a co-leader of the firm's commercial litigation practice. My practice focuses on uh, complex commercial disputes, often involving financial services clients or life science companies. Joining me today as a co-presenter is Lee Rubin. Lee, do you want to say a word about yourself? Sure. Thank you, Reg. Uh, uh, my name's Lee Rubin, and I'm a partner in our Palo Alto office and a member of the firm's litigation dispute resolution practice and uh, practice leader here in Northern California. Uh, my practice focuses on civil litigation and government investigations largely related to allegations of financial fraud. Over the years, I've been involved in a uh, number of civil litigation and government investigation matters related to the alleged misappropriation or theft of trade secrets as well. Great. Thank you, Lee. Um, well, before we begin, I have a, a few housekeeping announcements to make uh, before we jump into it. Um, the first is that uh, as we go along, we're hoping that you all will ask questions um, by using a Q&A panel. On the right side of your screen, uh, there's a Q&A panel, and if you uh, type in a question there, uh, it appears before us, and we'll try to answer it as we uh, go along or toward the end of the webinar. Um, sometimes if we're not able to answer your question during the presentation, we'll follow up with you directly once the webinar is concluded. The uh, second point, uh, uh, one reason why some of you may be here uh, is you may be looking for some CLE credits. Um, We're going to be providing an alphanumeric code uh, at some point during the presentation. Um, and in order to receive your CLE credits, you need to record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the login instructions for today's program. Uh, so uh, that will come up uh, uh, somewhere along the lines as we uh, do our presentation today. Um, and lastly, before we jump into this, uh, one caveat, which is obviously the views that Lee and I are expressing today are our own um, and should not be attributed to our firm or our clients. Um, so with those preliminaries out of the way, let me jump into uh, today's discussion. So uh, today's discussion, as the, as the title suggests, uh, is going to focus on trade secrets disputes um, and particularly on some of the critical issues that often arise uh, during the course of trade secrets claims. As Lee mentioned, both Lee and I have done a number of trade secrets uh, matters, uh, including some together. Um, so we've, we've got a, a, a few war stories, but we'll try not to bore you too much with those war stories. Um, we're also going to discuss, as we go along, uh, some of the changes in the trade secret law in particular. As, as many folks may know, uh, the Defend Trade Secrets Act was passed. It was a uh, federal statute that was passed last year, May, almost exactly one year ago. Um, and so we'll highlight uh, some of the changes that have been made by that statute um, and how it impacts uh, decisions and strategies of uh, both plaintiff and defendant as we go through here. So uh, uh, given folks on the phone uh, probably know this uh, if, you're, if you're signing up to be on this, uh, but as most folks know, trade secrets are becoming an increasingly uh, important part of companies' IP assets. Um, trade secrets include anything from you know, sort of technology uh, to, in, in the financial services space, we see algorithms, we see financial trading strategies, uh, we see software. Um, obviously, for other companies, we see manufacturing processes or improvements. Um, and then there's what I refer to as typical business information like customer lists, business plans. All of that uh, can constitute trade secrets and, as I said, is becoming an increasingly important part of companies' IP assets. Um, because of the growth of uh, the importance of trade secrets, we've also seen uh, a growth uh, in trade secret litigation over time. So uh, in just the U.S., PwC uh, has estimated that trade secret theft uh, may be worth as much as $450 billion annually. So it's a lot of value in terms of uh, secrets that are being taken, stolen, moved around, uh, and uh, could be subject to litigation. Uh, as a result, uh, in the past 20 years, there's been a huge explosion of trade secret cases, particularly uh, federal trade secret cases, where we've seen those doubling between 1995 and 2004, and the estimate is that by this year it was going to double again. I, I've not seen an update to those estimates recently, but uh, it's obviously a substantial growth in the number of trade secret cases that are being litigated. In terms of the types of litigation, uh, uh, types of matters that lead to litigation in trade secrets, there are really a couple of types that, that predominate. Uh, 
Um, the first type is uh, employee uh, trade secret litigation. This is where an employee will have worked for a company, um, have access to certain key information, and then as they leave, they're downloading it, putting it on the thumb drives, doing whatever they can to, to try to take that with them. Um, and it's been estimated that those uh, types of cases account for around 50 to 55 percent of all trade secrets cases uh, in the U.S. The other type that is uh, particularly significant is what I refer to as business partner uh, type trade secrets litigation. So these are cases where you may have a licensee where the license is expired, but the licensee continues to use the trade secrets, or where uh, you've gone to a potential partner, entered into an NDA, um, you d don't end up going forward with a transaction, uh, but later on the uh, potential partner comes out with a product that you think may have incorporated the trade secrets that you provided to them. So those types of cases are estimated to be about 35% of all trade secrets cases. So together, between business partners and employees, um, you're talking really about 85 to 90% of all trade secrets uh, involve uh, a dispute with somebody that the company knows well. Now the implication of that for companies is that uh, companies have a lot of control over the potential for trade secret theft um, in terms of being able to control access to what employees are able to get, um, the terms under which information is shared with partners, the entry of NDAs, uh, the entry of non-compete obligations, um, monitoring, downloading behavior, and other things that companies can do to control the limit of these trade secrets. That being said, uh, notwithstanding the fact that companies have a lot of control in this space, um, there are still a lot of litigations. And so the question is, when those controls don't succeed, how does a company go about protecting its rights? And obviously one of the answers to that um, involves litigation. So during today's discussion, as you see up on the slide, we're really going to focus on some of the critical steps uh, in trade secrets litigation in terms of being successful, both from the plaintiff's perspective and from the defense side. Um, this is one of those areas of the law where uh, we end up seeing uh, cases coming to us uh, from both sides of the aisle, um, and there are some different strategies that each side tends to uh, invoke in going through these uh, trade secrets cases. The first uh, and critical piece um, is figuring out where you want to bring your action and whether or not you need any preliminary remedy. Um, and we'll, as we talk about this, I'll say this is often a dispositive piece of litigation. Uh, if you don't get the preliminary remedies, if you don't get the TRO, often the horse has left the barn and you can fight about damages, but the, some of your uh, real rights are, are already uh, being impeded. So critical to get that piece right. The second uh, uh, area that's critical is pleading the trade secret claim. Um, and Lee's going to talk a little bit about uh, what plaintiffs need to do to be able to plead a, place, a trade secret claim in order to survive a motion to dismiss, and in some jurisdictions in order to get access to discovery and other tools. The third piece, um, and it's sort of tied into the second, is identifying the protectable trade secrets. For most companies, uh, trade secrets are not well defined. Companies spend a lot of time looking at patents and copyrights and things like that, but trade secrets are sort of the intangible cousin of uh, those more tangible IP rights. And, and as a result, companies often haven't really taken the time to figure out what is it really that we think is uh, important to us, is a secret, is something that allows us to make money, um, and that we need to make sure we protect. Um, and so when you get to litigation, there's often a good bit of the litigation that's spent trying to specifically define what is it that you really think is a trade secret. The fourth critical step is obviously figuring out whether the, uh, whether the defendants have used the trade secrets. Sometimes this is obvious, but often uh, you're having to make assumptions. Uh, you know, if it's an employee who left who's going into a, to a competitor at a similar job, you know, there's uh, a, an assumption or a presumption that's sometimes made that the employee is almost by necessity going to be using the trade secrets. Um, other times it may be informed by specific conduct. If somebody downloads a whole bunch of stuff right before leaving, leaving um, you can expect that that's going to lead to the use of trade secrets. But proving that, proving the use of trade secrets is obviously sometimes a significant hurdle in litigation. Um, and the last critical step is really around estimating damages. And, and while it's the last step chronologically in a litigation, it should really be one of the first steps in thinking about what you want to get out of a trade secret case. Assuming that, you, uh, uh, that the injunctive relief 
uh, is not sufficient um, or that this is about money as opposed to an injunction, it really takes uh, some thought to think about, okay, how are we going to quantify the damages? What sales have we actually lost? How are we going to be able to show that the trade secret theft led to those losses? Um, and ultimately, how much is it worth? Is it really worth spending our time to, uh, to do this, uh, to take this thing to litigation? So those are the key decisions, and, and that's really where I'm going to jump into. Focusing first on the, on the first key decision, which is um, where to bring the case and what sort of relief to look at. As I said before, uh, the, the common types of cases tend to fall into similar fact patterns, former employees taking a trade secret uh, or a business partner uh, to, uh, breaching an NDA or something similar to that. The type of case often informs the jurisdiction or the venue for where it's going to be litigated. So obviously, if you're looking at a business-to-business -business case, um, some of those instances will be governed by an arbitration provision. Uh, you may have a joint venture agreement that's been breached, or you may have other uh, contracts between the parties that have been breached. And sometimes, uh, some people try to get cute and try to figure out whether there's a way to argue that the trade secrets breach is not included within the scope of the arbitration provision. In my experience, that fight is probably not worth it. Uh, the arbitration uh, forum itself is usually a pretty good place uh, in, in most arbitrations to litigate the trade secret issue. You have some built-in confidentiality, which is important to the trade secrets case. Um, and even if you need preliminary relief, there's usually an opportunity under most arbitral rules for you to get some of that preliminary relief uh, from courts uh, before you enter into the um, arbitration. Um, so from my perspective, it's really usually not worth trying to have the fight as to whether some portion of this is not covered by the arbitration provision. But let's say you're not, you don't have an arbitration provision, you don't have a contract, you have an employee or something like this. Often you're looking at state or federal courts. Um, in employee-employer disputes, the, probably the primary uh, forum for those types of disputes has been state courts, largely because uh, you have an employee in one state and an employer in one state. You don't have diversity jurisdiction. You don't have other federal claims to bring. So by default, you're left at the state court. That is one of the things that the new DTSA has changed um, by creating a federal remedy it has allowed for bringing those sort of employee-employer trade secret claims into a federal court, grants federal jurisdiction over those types of claims. Um, and so that's a new available forum for a lot of those disputes. One other that I didn't put on the slide, but it's worth considering. If you're in a business-to-business -business dispute, you have someone importing uh, products from overseas that you think uh, may have been manufactured or may have somehow used your trade secret. Um, another forum to consider is the International Trade Commission, the ITC, uh, which has the authority to exclude products from the borders and does, uh, it's been decided over and over again, uh, have uh, uh, jurisdiction over trade secrets disputes uh, that may have uh, led to an infringing product being imported. So it's another forum to consider. In terms of preliminary relief, and I'm going to uh, talk about this in more detail, the three main types of preliminary relief you want to think about are whether you want a TRO. Uh, this is typically uh, some sort of a, a restraining order that keeps the employee from sharing certain information. Sometimes it can, uh, it, you can ask for one that will keep them from actually moving to a competitor, but those are much harder to get. A second type of preliminary relief is expedited discovery. Um, often you don't really need to or you don't necessarily know what you need to do in terms of what needs to be restrained, um, but you need some expedited discovery to figure out what was downloaded on the thumb drive, how much information is actually out there. The third type of preliminary relief um, is one that's been supplemented and added to by the DTSA, which is a seizure uh, remedy. Um, and under the DTSA, there are new rights, as I'll discuss in a minute, that allow you to seize uh, infringing products um, uh, even with an ex parte uh, seizure order, uh, which is a pretty extreme remedy, and as I'll discuss in a minute, it's uh, rarely one that uh, uh, courts turn to. So looking first at the question of jurisdiction, as I said, the DTSA creates federal question jurisdiction. Um, in fact, in the last year, while the DTSA has um, been in place, a number of cases have relied solely on the existence of the DTSA to have jurisdiction. In one case, a party was able to add to the action a non-diverse defendant 
um, which would have otherwise uh, precluded federal question jurisdiction, uh, but at the same time they added the DTSA claim to keep the federal question jurisdiction. So it, it is a, uh, it does give you the ability to do things in federal court you didn't have before. Where that puts um, some pressure, though, is determining whether or not the DTSA in fact applies. Now, in most cases, the DTSA does apply, but there are two circumstances, at least, where the DTSA won't apply. The first is if the infringing conduct, the, uh, the theft of the trade secret, the, the misappropriation, occurred before the passage of the DTSA, and if none of the use of that uh, uh, trade secret occurred after the passage of the DTSA. So the DTSA um, precludes both misappropriation and use of a trade secret. Um, if you can show that either happened after the passage of the DTSA, you'll have jurisdiction. Um, most courts um, have found fairly uh, minimal use to be sufficient to give you DTSA jurisdiction, although in one court uh, they found that the fact that the um, defendant had filed a patent and had not withdrawn that patent after the DTSA was passed was not sufficient uh, to constitute use such that you could bring an action under the DTSA. The other critical thing that you need to have in order to proceed under the DTSA is that the product needs to be used in or intended to be used in interstate or foreign commerce. Um, as most folks know, the definition of interstate commerce is, has been very broad. Um, in most circumstances, even in the employee-employer uh, situation, uh, what the uh, defendant employer is producing is likely to be sold in interstate commerce. Um, my guess is that that is going to be a very low threshold. So far, no cases have, in fact, tried to test uh, how low that threshold actually is. The question you may ask is, well, okay, is it worth my while to proceed with the DTSA? Why would I want to do that? Um, and there are really a, a couple of reasons why the DTSA uh, may give you some benefits. Um, taking a half a step back, it's important to note that the DTSA was modeled on the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, and the Uniform Trade Secrets Act was, in fact, uh, been adopted by uh, 48 of the 50 states. Um, so most of the definitions in the DTSA are identical to what's in the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, and so there's not really much difference substantively. There are some difference in terms of remedies and a little bit in terms of procedure. So uh, from a remedies perspective, the DTSA specifically covers conduct that occurs overseas if it is done by a U.S. entity or if some conduct, any conduct, is performed in the U.S., uh, you can bring those sorts of actions under the DTSA in a federal court. Um, and uh, a recent case I decided about a month ago in South Carolina confirmed uh, that that is a, a right that will allow you to get uh, access to the federal court through the DTSA. Um, the other thing that, uh, that you can do in federal court that you may not be able to do in some state courts, and I think Lee will talk more about this, is that there are some state procedural rules that prevent you from getting discovery if you don't adequately plead or identify your trade secret. In federal court on the DTSA, that doesn't exist, and so that's a, another benefit. The last thing is, obviously, as I mentioned before, the DTSA itself provides a seizure remedy in certain cases. Um, and so it's an additional remedy that some folks may want to take advantage of. Reg, let me just ask you, um, since the passage of the DTSA, have uh, we seen an uptick in the number of uh, trade secret cases filed? Uh, you, you've, you've identified some of the potential advantages or, uh, and the possibility of more employer-employee disputes going into federal court. Has that manifested itself in terms of the number of court filings? Yeah, interestingly enough, Lee, that has, uh, we've not seen that in terms of the numbers. Um, there's been an analysis uh, that I've seen uh, about nine months into the DTSA, so a couple months ago, um, where the level of uh, trade secrets claims being filed in uh, federal district court are no more uh, than what would have been par for the year before. Um, so it's not clear yet the extent to which uh, plaintiffs are taking advantage of uh, the DTSA in federal court. Um, it may be that uh, in some circumstances, uh, you know, the, the, the state court remedy was sufficient. Uh, it may be that some folks aren't sufficiently aware of the DTSA remedy, um, or there may be other reasons that, that it hasn't been leveraged. But so far, it's not led to a uh, substantial uptick uh, in terms of, of uh, cases. And, and that may also be, in part, 
uh, some plaintiffs, I think, may feel that they have a benefit of, of proceeding in, in their own state in a state court, um, and so they may feel that that gives them a better forum for litigating a trade secret case than the federal court does. Um, I will note that, you know, at least in my mind, uh, the, the federal court is, is a bit of a no-lose situation because the DTSA does not preempt state law. So you can go to federal court, bring an action under DTSA, bring a parallel action under the state uh, UTSA, and to the extent that there's any differences between them, you can win under either of those two statutes. So you have really essentially two bites at the apple. And I expect that as, uh, as we go forward, uh, more and more uh, cases will get filed in federal courts, but we just haven't seen it yet. So shifting to another topic, which is really around the uh, remedies. Um, there are, as I said before, there are uh, three types of preliminary remedies that one wants to think about uh, when bringing an action. The first is really a TRO. Uh, again, if the employee took some stuff or if you want to keep the employee from sharing information with a uh, competitor, a TRO is the way to go. Uh, most folks are familiar with the standard. It's uh, likelihood of success and uh, irreparable harm, the imminence of irreparable harm. Um, Often it's, it's hard to succeed here unless you can show that there's some concrete information that was downloaded. There's a very good likelihood that this is going to get used. Um, so it's, it's not one that, uh, you know, is automatic. But if you can make those couple of showings, um, it, uh, it can be pretty compelling. Um, the one thing with respect to the DTSA here, uh, a, number of core, a number of states uh, restrict non-compete obligations, and so you really can't get a TRO or an injunction to prohibit somebody from going over to a competitor because of state restrictions on non-compete obligations. The DTSA is not a way to circumvent those particular restrictions. Um, it specifically provides that if there are state law limits on the enforcement of non-compete obligations, it does not supersede those limits. So uh, unfortunately, if, if you were looking for a remedy for that, that the DTSA does not provide you that. Um, as I mentioned before, a second uh, immediate remedy is, is under expedited discovery, um, and there are uh, a number of things you can do early on in a case to try to figure out exactly what was taken from you so you can form the rest of your uh, litigation strategy around it. Um, and then the last is the uh, seizure remedy I mentioned before. As I said, it's extremely strict remedy. Uh, the statute itself says it's only provided in extraordinary circumstances to prevent the propagation of the trade secret and only if other requirements are met, including um, that an order pursuant to Rule 65, which would give you a TRO, uh, would be inadequate, and that the defendant is likely to move or hide the assets. Um, so in the, in the year since the DTSA has come into uh, existence, uh, there's really only one case that has, in fact, granted an ex parte seizure where they granted an ex parte seizure with respect to uh, a contact list that had been stolen from an employer and taken by the employee. Um, so those are really the preliminary remedies. I want to turn it over to Lee to talk a little bit about the uh, pleading requirements for a trade secrets claim. Thanks, Reg. So uh, slide eight, I, we begin to talk about the uh, the sort of the guts or the core of a trade secret claim, and, and essentially it can be it can be broken down into three discrete elements: the existence of a protect of a protectable trade secret, the misappropriation of the secret by uh, the defendant, if we're talking about litigation. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, misappropriation can be by use or by disclosure. And uh, then damages. Uh, of course, as Reg just spoke about, you can seek equitable injunctive relief as well. But uh, assuming you're proceeding in court, typically uh, depending upon you know, if the misappropriation uh, it has occurred and there is some impact in the market, you're typically going to see requests for damages. Um, and Reg spoke quite a bit about the DTSA. Uh, the DTSA really does graft, uh, for all material purposes, the UTSA elements, and that's essentially what the federal courts have found. Um, there are, and I'll highlight a couple, there are um, some distinctions, some states in in adopting their own version of the UTSA have tweaked certain elements. Um, some states, for example, have uh, the inevitable discovery um, rule where, you know, essentially if you're, if an employee has been um, so tainted by 
trade secret information that it's inevitable that he would share that with an employer and since certain states that would allow you to get injunctive relief or in some states like California, it's effectively impossible. Uh, the inevitable discovery rule doesn't apply, which obviously is part of a overall policy view the, to increase and enhance employee mobility. So there are differences among states, but in terms of the DTSA, they largely graph the model UTSA. Um, so looking at slide nine, um, what is it that uh, a plaintiff must do to adequately uh, plead a trade secret claim? And this is, this is important and actually becoming more important as you look at the trend in the case law because, um, because uh, you know, Reg, Reg made a reference to sort of the kissing cousin to patents and, and courts uh, you know, have struggled over the years with the notion of what exactly is a trade secret and what does it have to include or what are its essential elements. And as you might imagine, courts are reluctant to uh, require a particular element to always be in a trade secret, but what they have insisted upon, at least before a case gets to trial, is that, is that the trade secrets be identified with sufficient particularity that the court and the defendant and ultimately a judge or jury understands what it is that's, that is allegedly, uh, that has allegedly been stolen. Um, and the pleading stage, in federal court and in state court, it's fairly permissive. So if you identify, if you describe, uh, uh, just as in any other federal complaint or state court complaint that has notice pleading, uh, if you describe your trade secret with sort of the basic uh, contours of the, the, the idea, concept, design, in, in general terms, you're typically going to survive a motion to dismiss. But there's a very distinct difference between how courts treat the pleading and how courts look at your uh, definition of a trade secret by the time you actually get to the summary judgment phase. And at that phase, uh, you must do more than just identifying categorical terms or broad terms in terms of what information has been shared with a business partner or what information an employee has been privy to. You have to be far more specific and particular about what the particular trade secrets you're alleging have been stolen. And the courts have become more and more stringent over the years that that has to be sufficiently defined in order for you to survive summary judgment and get to trial. Uh, and, and I'll note that if we look at slide 10, um, uh, I'll note that there are a number of cases over the years that have indicated that it may well be that summary judgment that embedded uh, within a very broad and voluminous trade secret identification there are or there potentially are protectable trade secrets, but the courts have emphatically said it's not the court's job and it's not the defendant's job to ferret those out, to try to, to, try to extract those. So let me give you a concrete example. Uh, if, uh, there, if in a business relationship, in a, uh, in a discussion about the potential, a potential business venture, you share uh, a 100-page report about an idea or a concept or some design ideas that you have with a, with a potential business partner, and then you believe that after that discussion, which was protected by a non-disclosure agreement, that uh, the party you shared it with has somehow incorporated or used those trade secrets in some future product, it's not going to be enough to point to that 100-page report. Most courts would say, you have to be more specific. You can't just say, I shared information, it was under an NDA, we, we decided all of it was confidential, and we think that some of it has made its way into their new product or their new ideas. That's not going to be enough. You're going to have to, within that material that you shared, you're going to have to identify what are the particular protectable trade secrets that you claim that you have in order for those particular issues to be teed up for the court and for the jury. Now, in, as we see in slide 10, in particular, in some jurisdictions, such as California, this particularity requirement actually applies during discovery. So. Uh, or I should say not during discovery, as a prerequisite to discovery. So in California, and there are a handful of other states that have this as well, um, the, the defendant is not obligated to provide any discovery unless and until uh, the plaintiff sufficiently identifies its trade secrets. So 
again, again, as a practical matter, if discovery is served, uh, uh, a defendant may move to strike that discovery or to, uh, to resist that discovery if they don't believe that the trade secrets either in the complaint or in an identification has been properly identified. And then you may, even after the identification, get into litigation at a very early stage on whether a trade secret identification that is prepared by the plaintiff is sufficiently particular. Now, now in we, some jurisdictions uh, that where where and in the de and in the federal court context where that is not where the, there is no prerequisite rule that you know you you have to to, to particular to sufficiently identify your trade secrets with particularity you have to resort to federal court discovery essentially the rules of civil procedure uh, in order yeah, to identify those trade secrets. I, mean, I was going to ask you because as, as a defendant, I like being in those jurisdictions where uh, they have to identify it before you really get into discovery. But when you're not in a jurisdiction like that, um, what are some of the tools that you use to, um, to uh, be able to ferret out what the trade secret really is? Well, you, you have, I think you essentially have to be creative and use all of the tools of discovery that are available to you under the federal rules. So, for example, the use of interrogatories. Uh, uh, I, we found in our experience that the use of Rule 30b-6 deposition, if, you're, if the uh, uh, plaintiff is, a, is an entity, is a company, that you, that you uh, notice a 30b-6 deposition specifically on the topics of what are your trade secrets. Uh, you might have the occasion to use uh, requests for admission. So you basically have your toolbox of discovery and then you have to think creatively about how do I attempt to uh, narrow down and pin down the plaintiff on specifically what trade secrets they're proceeding with. And, and this is an important, even though you know, in federal court and in certain states it's not a discovery prerequisite, courts will look at the efforts that you have taken to try to pin down the plaintiff in terms of what its trade secrets are, and I think it's going to be more inclined, it's going to be more sympathetic to a motion, to a summary judgment motion that the plaintiff never met, adequately met its burden of identifying trade secrets if you've attempted through these various discovery procedures to narrow down and pin down their trade secret claim. Obviously, the dynamic here as it is in other kinds of litigation is sometimes a plaintiff understandably wants to maintain, uh, um, maintain a, a fair amount of breadth to its trade secrets identification because it's taking discovery. And so it doesn't want to cordon itself off or commit itself er as early in the case if it's in the middle of uh, deposition or in the middle of discovery. But ultimately, the cases are fairly uniform, but that by the time you get to summary judgment, that, and, and some cases certainly hint at before that time so that the defendant has fair notice to respond, uh, a plaintiff has to identify its trade secrets with particularity. Um, but it's important to use those discovery tools to try to ferret that out. Now, what are the, looking at slide 11 briefly, what are the kinds of, of uh, identifications that the courts have rejected as, as not meeting the standard at summary judgment? Well, you know, we just canvassed the case law briefly here, but you can see it falls, I would say it falls generally into three or four different categories. One is just overbroad or overinclusive. So referring back to the example I alluded to earlier where you essentially just point to all the material that you provided to a business partner or to an employee and say all of it was confidential, all of it was uh, trade secret material. If the court has any sense that some of the material is, uh, is a matter of public knowledge, industry knowledge, even, even if there's some indication that there might be some underlying protectable information, the court's going to say that's too broad. You have to be more specific. It's over-inclusive. Uh, vagueness. If your description of the trade secret is so vague and so undefined or indistinct that it captures um, uh, too much of, uh, of an industry's knowledge or trends or, or information, the court's going to say you need to be more specific. You can't just 
broadly state that the kind of information that would sweep in lots of information within an industry or within even the particular area that would designate it all as trade secrets. Categorical. You can't just point to categories. These are the kinds of, these are the, this is the kind of information. You know, if you're talking about in financial services, for example, an algorithm or something that you're using for asset selection, asset management selection, you can't just categorically talk about, you know, tools designed for purposes of identifying equity stocks that are more likely to grow over time. You have to be more specific in terms of some design formula or specific concept or idea that underlies that algorithm. So, and you can see some of these other examples where they've, the plaintiffs have effectively done the data dump and the courts have rejected that. We're going to now talk about what, what, how is a trade secret defined? And this is actually getting to what are the parameters of a protectable trade secret? So, we have information and again, you know, you'll look at it and you'll say, well, this is broad. And I think this is one of the reasons the courts have really pushed litigants to identify and be more particular and specific about what they're actually alleging. But it is broadly stated information, including any formula pattern or compilation that, and this is really the key, that derives independent economic value from it continuing to be secret. And when you think about from just a conceptual vantage point, that really is what a trade secret is. Because when you look, all of the elements flow from the notion that if there's no value that comes from the secrecy, then it's not a trade secret. So, if you're talking about an idea, but it's generally available, that same idea or concept or even design is generally available in textbooks or industry journals, then it doesn't, there's no value from its secrecy. So, you'll see in terms of the elements and what the courts look at to determine whether they're protectable trade secret is this, it actually really conceptually flows from the notion of economic value deriving from its continued secrecy. And then, of course, the last element, which is subject of quite a bit of litigation and trade secret litigation, is did the plaintiff take adequate steps to guard, reasonable steps to maintain the secrecy of its alleged trade secret, to safeguard it? The DTSA really uses materially identical standards. So, looking at slide 14, information, there's always this notion that, well, an idea, an abstract idea or a concept can't really be a trade secret. But there's a fairly wide array of cases that address this. Some do suggest that a broad or abstract idea or concept really can't be susceptible to trade secret protection, where other cases have said that, at least in theory, they can be. And I think, looking at slide 15, these different strands of precedent, I think, can be reconciled by the notion that, really, I think what courts are getting at is the more abstract of a general idea you're trying to protect, the more likely it is that it doesn't, there's no value from its continued secrecy. Because once you're at a certain level of abstraction, it's highly likely that the information can be gleaned from elsewhere. Either the receiving party understands it already, if it's in the industry, or it's well-known in the trade, or well-known in the industry, or in the public at large. So, I think that, again, where the cases might talk about a concept or idea may or may not be the kind of information that could be a trade secret, what they're really getting at is, if it's so abstract, it's really not the kind of thing that derives value from its continued secrecy. And I think courts have tried to put some additional gloss on that by noting that even where you have an idea or concept that you're trying to avail yourself of trade secret protection, it must be concrete, but it must be something that you can actually latch onto and not just an ephemeral idea. And it has to have substantial novelty. Now, for those who have dealt with patent litigation at all, you know that novelty is a prerequisite to a patent. Trade secret laws generally stayed away from that element of that it has to be novel, but 
I think that the courts have generally said, you know, again, getting at this notion that it can't generally be something that's known. It has to be substantially novel. That is, at least a new twist on an, uh, on an existing theme, something that is different and unique. Um, that's not just a restatement of a general principle that's well known. Um, one very important element that runs through trade secret cases for many years is that courts have recognized that even if there are a number of ideas that are generally known within the trade or within the industry, but the, but the plaintiff has put them together, combined them in a way that's unique, that warrants trade secret protection. So uh, simply because elements of the concept design um, formula that you have might be known. If you've done something different with the information that's publicly available, you still may be entitled to trade secret protection. Um, looking at slide 16, um, again, just briefly, I think this, re, this th these cases really reiterate what we're, what we're talking about in terms of the element of deriving independent value. So courts are quite clear that matters of public knowledge or general knowledge can't be uh, misappropriated by one is the secret. Um, it, and just as importantly, and this is particularly important in a business venture context, it may well be that, that you have two firms or three firms or the leading firms in an industry who are all researching something at the same time. It may not necessarily be known within the industry because it's new, um, but the industry leaders are researching it. So even if even if something is not generally known to the industry, if you're a defendant and you can establish uh, uh, that you, even if the general industry didn't know that you were already onto the concept, idea, formula, design, that you already were understood it, even if the general industry didn't, that's another defense to trade secret misappropriation. Now, let's turn uh, to page 17 about um, reasonable efforts to maintain the secrecy of information. Um, so we just talked about sort of without your participation, if information is known uh, either in the industry or, or known by the party who received uh, your uh, alleged protectable trade secret information, that that essentially defeats a trade secret claim. The third element is really what have you done to safeguard the information that you claim is a trade secret. And, and the touchstone of this element is you have to have taken reasonable safeguards. Now, when you talk about reasonableness, you say, well, that's really going to be a fact-intensive question. And generally that's true, although there are certainly a number of cases where the plaintiff has shared his, inform shared his or her information with so many people with such little safeguards over time that the courts have found as a matter of law that they've lost trade secret protection. So the most obvious, the most obvious um, uh, action that can extinguish trade secret protection is public disclosure. If, if you post your information on a website or it, it's, there's a mass circulation of your information, um, that's going to extinguish uh, the trade secret. Um, and uh, other reasonable, reasonable efforts to maintain secrecy uh, include you know, have, what have you done internally uh, to guard the trade secret? You know, what have, how, have you, how have you maintained the trade secret within your company? Has it been on a need-to-know basis? Have you controlled the dissemination of it? To the extent that you've shared the information with any others, either customers or potential joint venture partners, how have you protected that information? What have you done to ensure that they're going to treat it confidentially and that it's not broadly released? And uh, ancillary to that, the courts have been quite consistent in finding that if you uh, file a patent application, and within that patent application are the subsequent information disclosures, uh, you uh, disclose or reveal your trade secret information, you can't go back and then claim that, um, that that's still protected, that that is uh, a public disclosure of the information. Okay, uh, looking at slide 18, um, you know, what, what are, you know, sort of taking a step back, you can see all of these cases sort of 
cut it different ways of what reasonable safeguards are. But, but if I were to take a step back and tell people what do I think best practices are, um, I think you know when you when you look at the landscape, you really need to take all the steps you can think of to protect your trade secret to enhance the prospects that you'll be able to that you'll be able to maintain trade secret protection and actually seek injunctive relief or or claim that it's been misappropriated. So just for starters, if you share it outside your company, you you certainly want some kind of non-disclosure agreement. And it wouldn't, it's generally not considered enough uh, and not reasonable to just share it without getting some kind of a return commitment of confidentiality. It doesn't mean that if the uh, receiving party uh, breaches it or doesn't follow through on it that you've lost your protection, but you've done all you can do. So not just labeling it confidential, not just saying, hey, you know, we'd appreciate if you keep this close to the vest, but actually asking and executing an NDA that, that as a legal matter protects the information. Uh, in addition to that, you do want to label, you do want to have password protected files. If uh, there are hard copies of materials or formulas, designs, you want to maintain those um, in password protected or encrypted files. If there are hard copies of materials, you want to keep those um, in a safe place, whether it's a safe or someplace under lock and key, so that if and when the time comes that the court turns and says, what safeguards have you taken, you're able to provide a laundry list. And again, the touchstone is reasonableness. It doesn't mean that it, doesn't mean it has to be perfect, but it means that you have, from the start, treated it like it's confidential and that there is value in its secrecy. Uh, looking at um, uh, looking at slide 19, where a company enters into an NDA, but but individuals did not execute the NDA, that at least uh, by some courts have been found to extinguish trade secret protection. So this is yet just another warning sign that even if even if you've entered into an agreement with a company you're sharing information with, best practices you should ask the company to just like you do with a protective order in court, that anybody that they share the information with, they should execute some kind of a confidentiality pledge that they'll maintain the secrecy of the information. Um, I think we're running short on time, so let me, let me just say one, one or two minutes about improper use, and then I'm gonna turn it back over to Reg for, for damages. Um, big picture, for misappropriation, you can prove by use or disclosure. Disclosure is usually more straightforward. Use can, as Reg alluded to earlier, often be more opaque and, and less clear. Uh, I think the sort of the bottom line is that that where courts draw the line typically is if there's any indication that it's been incorporated in any manner into somebody's product or service. Uh, or commercial activity. So it doesn't have to be taken wholesale, it doesn't have to be lifted, it doesn't have to be a mirror image, but if there's evidence that it was embodied or incorporated, uh, uh, taken even if it was modified and revised uh, as part of the receiving party's product, uh, courts have found that's use. On the other end of the spectrum, just simply uh, having possession of it, looking at looking at something that's a trade secret while you're developing a product, that it was in your mind uh, while you were developing another product, uh, that it might that it that you know it might have sort of broadly speaking shed light on you know what the market thinks, that's typically not enough. You need to show some kind of embodiment or incorporation of your of your trade secret in order to show misappropriation. So with that, let me turn it back over to you, Reg. Sure, I'm gonna uh, talk uh, just briefly about the, uh, the damages piece. Uh, as I said at the, at the start, um, understanding what your damages are, um, how you're gonna quantify them uh, is critical and uh, getting a sense as to which of several damages theories you want to use is also uh, fairly important to think through uh, from the beginning. So uh, I'm gonna go through, there are really uh, four, types of, um, or four or five types of uh,
damages that you can get under misappropriation uh, theory. One is your actual loss. The second is uh, unjust enrichment to the extent that the defendant was unjustly enriched by the use of the trade secret. The third, and, and we'll talk about when this comes into play, is a reasonable royalty. And then the fourth is really a punitive damages measure that's available both under the DTSA and under state ETSA provision. Um, the choice amongst those usually depends on what you think can be proven, right? If you uh, have a long track record of being in business, then someone steals your uh, trade secret, and then uh, you see a marked decline in your own revenues and profits, that's probably an indicator that using your own numbers is uh, pretty good. Um, a lot of times, if your trade secret gets stolen, uh, you may go out of business or things like that. Uh, you can think about the business value uh, and the value of the business itself that was lost. Um, there are other times when it's more, it, it's easier to think about what the defendant has gained. Um, you can see their revenue uplift. You can see the new clients they brought on board. Uh, you can uh, look at their uh, profitability. Sometimes uh, your, their profitability is more than yours. So you want to think about that because that really uh, um, plays a big factor in which uh, damages theory you want to pursue. So the first one, as I mentioned, is actual loss. And in actual loss, um, there are several things that you can point to. One, the most obvious is lost profits. Um, typically, this is lost sales that you've lost, um, and then you subtract out the expenses that would have been saved, but for the breach, and we'll talk about the causation requirement, which is critical. Um, and uh, it, it's also important to know that courts will look for a reasonable amount of certainty as to proof of that loss, but it doesn't necessarily need to be down to the penny or nickel. So um, usually this is done by experts being able to take before and after pictures and taking a picture of what the but-for world looks like. But as I said, uh, and I'll discuss in a second, under causation, trying to figure out that but-for world is pretty difficult. The second area of damages that uh, is one that's worthwhile to think about is price erosion. Often you don't go out of business, you continue to sell your product, but the competitor is now selling a product as well. You used to have uh, you know, a good share of the market, uh, maybe you were the only one who offered a particular product, and now you have to drop your price in order to compete. That is uh, compensable damages uh, under a trade secret theory. And the third one, as I mentioned before, is a lost value of business. Sometimes you actually go out of business, or sometimes you close a business line or other things, and uh, it's often possible to put a value, a dollar value, on uh, a particular business. Um, and those dollar values can often be fairly significant in the context of, uh, of looking at damages. The alternative damage theory um, that people often will consider will be an unjust enrichment damage theory. And as I said before, this is really looking at what the defendant got that they wouldn't have been able to get um, by using your trade secrets. Um, and so this is, in some respects, it's the flip side of the lost profits damages theory, um, except that there are a couple of other things that the, damage, that the uh, defendant might have gotten. So, for example, they might have been able to develop a product uh, at substantially lower cost because they already knew where they were going. Or they may have gotten what's called head start damages, which is uh, that by accessing your trade secrets, they were able to get into the market 8 or 10 or 12 months earlier because they didn't have to spend as much time trying to develop the product on their own. So both of those are measures of unjust enrichment in addition to the defendant's increased profits or sales um, that one might look to for an unjust enrichment theory. One note I would make is that Usually, unjust enrichment and uh, lost profits are alternative theories. There are some circumstances when you can look to try to get both. For example, if you uh, lower your price in order to compete with an infringing product, um, you have the loss, uh, the, the, the price drop portion, um, while you would also still potentially be able to get the portion that the defendant was able to get through the sale of the infringing product. The critical element for both of those, lost profits and unjust enrichment, is being able to show causation. The element, the, uh, the, the standard for loss causation is a but-for standard or approximate cause standard. Some courts have talked about this as you have to be able to show that the conduct played a substantial factor in creating damages. The, the difficulty here is it's almost never the case that, you, that one thing alone cause somebody uh, to be successful in the market. There's usually many things that the uh, infringing party did uh, of their own accord that were totally independent that, that um, uh, could have accounted for a large portion of their profits. And we, we saw it in the recent case of uh, Mattel uh, with the Bratz dolls. And while there was some portion of 
the Bratz line that was attributable to the theft of trade secrets, the court said so much was done by the defendant to develop the line, to develop additional characters, to do additional things to market the line, um, that it was not proper to measure the damages by all of the value of that new business that had been put into place. So uh, what I would say about damages is it's very idiosyncratic and very specific to the specific circumstances. Your expert needs to take into consideration uh, the other possible causes, needs to find a way to isolate the trade secrets damage and to quantify it. It can be a daunting task. Um, but I do want to offer one uh, alternative, which is uh, the alternative of reasonable royalty. And this is usually an alternative that's available when it's difficult or impossible to show the causal connection between the theft. Um, but there is still uh, clear evidence of value to the trade secret itself. In those circumstances, courts will sometimes say, okay, well, we'll try to estimate what the reasonable royalty would have been, putting ourselves back in the position of a hypothetical negotiation at the time of infringement, what would the parties have agreed to? And there they'll typically look at existing license agreements that already exist. Um, they'll look at what are called the Georgia Pacific factors, a, a number of factors that uh, were laid out in the Georgia Pacific case in terms of uh, how the parties would have negotiated those particular licenses. Um, and it, again, this can become an extremely factual analysis Right? Was one party actually willing to license? Have they ever licensed it under similar circumstances? How do you know something is similar? But if you can't show the causal connection to get the lost profits or the uh, unjust enrichment, this is another method of going about trying to quantify your damages. And then the last thing I'll say on, on this um, is uh, around punitive damages. And, I, and I'll only say this uh, to say that punitive damages are available both under the DTSA and under most states' uh, Uniform Trade Secrets Act, what you have to show is either intentional misappropriation. So, for example, in the Mangren case, they were joking about the fact that they had won trade secret cases before, before they infringed the second trade secret. Or you have to show a knowing disregard for the plaintiff's rights. So, you know, if you, for example, viewed the trade secret information um, and then entered into an agreement with the employee that they would indemnify you for any claim, well, that's a pretty good indicator that you knew that the information was a trade secret, that you were exposing yourself to liability, um, but you disregarded the plaintiff's rights. So those are the kinds of showings you'd have to do. But if you do it, you can usually get uh, two times the compensatory damages, um, and it's a pretty valuable right. The one thing I would say is that under the DTSA, where you're bringing a claim against a former employee, you do not get access to those sort of punitive damages if you have not put in a notice of immunity um, to, the, to the employee. And what I mean by notice of immunity, uh, immunity is given to employees um, if they use your trade secrets to become a whistleblower, if they give it to their lawyers or do other things to become a whistleblower. Um, in order to be able to get your punitive damages remedies, you have to have provided either in company manuals and agreements with the employee some notice that they're able to use your trade secrets to do that. If you don't do that, if you don't give them notice of their right to do that, uh, then when you go to get your punitive damages against that employee for infringing, um, the employee will have a defense against those punitive damages because you failed to give the notice, and that is written into the DTSA statute. Um, so with that, uh, I think we are out of time. It's uh, 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 already after 2 o'clock. I see that we did get uh, a couple of questions. Um, I apologize we didn't uh, have enough time to get to them. Uh, Lee and I will try to respond to your questions uh, separately via email um, and, uh, and uh, get back to you on that. But in any event, we, we hope that uh, the information that we shared today uh, was useful. Um, and uh, we will follow up directly with those who ask questions. If anyone has additional questions related to today's topic, if you want to email them to A Keating, that's A K E A T I N G at mayorbrown.com, uh, Lee and I will work also to, uh, to answer those questions as well. So, again, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, I, I hope that uh, this was helpful. Uh, look forward to any additional questions you all have, and uh, please have a great day. Thank you very much.